الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ علیہ علیہ صاحب اجمین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والعصر ان الانسان لفی خسر اللہ الدین آمن و امن و صالحات و تواصب الحق تواصب صبر ربش علی صدری و صلی عمری وحل العقدت من لسان افقا و قولی آئی ویلکم آل دی ویورس آف دی پیش ٹی وی نیٹ ورک دی پیش ٹی وی انگلش دی پیش ٹی وی اردو دی پیش ٹی وی بنگلہ اینڈ دی پیش ٹی وی چائنیز ایز ویل ایز مائی فور سوشل میڈیا پلیٹ فارمس وچ آ دی فیس بک دی یوٹیوب دی انسٹاگرام اینڈ ٹویٹر آئی ویلکم آل دی ویورس ود اسلام گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ می پیس mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I welcome you to this program. Ask Dr. Zakir Anithan Farik, Season 2, Session 1. You were just hearing my son, Farik Naik, who was handling the question answer session live from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And I'm sorry for the interruption because the network was very bad. Inshallah, I will continue the session and here you're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion. Any question which a non-Muslim or an atheist may have asked you and you are unable to reply. Any question that you find in the media attacking Islam or you require a logical reply or a scientific reply, this is the opportunity. You can ask your questions on any of my social media platforms but the best is texting the question in brief on the WhatsApp, mentioning your name, your profession and the city and country of residence to the WhatsApp number plus 60-11-269-53895. I repeat, plus 60-11-269-53895. Now we will Take the first question. The first question is from Mehtab, West Bengal, India. Is it permissible to convert a church or a temple into a mosque after that area is conquered by the Muslims? And a similar question of the same category is asked by Munir from London, UK. What are your views? regarding Erdogan, the president of Turkey, converting the Hagia Sophia from the status of a museum to that of a mosque. There are two questions asked by the brothers. The first question is that is it permissible in Islam to convert a church or a temple or house of worship of a non-Muslim to a mosque after that land is conquered by the Muslims? The reply to this is yes. There are several hadith and there are several references that it is permissible to convert the house of worship of the non-Muslims to a mosque if the Muslim wants to after they conquer the land. But regarding those places of worship where there is a contract with the non-Muslims, for example, if a non-Muslim has a contract with the Muslims and they have a treaty that we accept you as our rulers or If the non-Muslim, they surrender and they agree to be under the rulership of the Muslims, then these non-Muslims are called as Dhimmi. So as far as non-Muslims who are Dhimmi, who are protected by the Muslim rulers, in this there is a special condition and a treaty that their lives will be protected by the Muslim rulers, their houses will be protected, their place of worship will be protected. So in such a case where there is a contract between the Muslim ruler or they have surrendered to the Muslim ruler or they have invited them to take over from the ruler which is unjust and if there is a contract and there is no war, in these cases they are called as dhimmi and the non-Muslim they have to pay a jazia for protection. Under these conditions, the Muslims are supposed to protect the lives of the non-Muslims, their homes as well as their house of worship. But They cannot build new houses of worship which belong to non-Muslims. They cannot expand it, but they can keep it. And here, the Muslims will not touch the house of worship of the non-Muslims. But if the Muslims conquer the land, in this case, it is perfectly permissible for the Muslims to convert it into a mosque. 
As far as the second question is concerned, that what are my views regarding the issue that has taken place today? And we know that the court has given the verdict and Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has said that the Hagia Sophia, which was a museum, would be reverted back to a mosque. Let me first give you a brief regarding the history of Hagia Sophia so that people who are unaware will know about it and then I will give my views. As far as Hagia Sophia is concerned, it's a monument which is there for about 1,500 years. It was built by Emperor Justinian I in 537 CE. It took about a few years for him to build and it was a cathedral of the Greek Orthodox. And it remained a cathedral for several centuries. In 1204, during the Fourth Crusaders, they converted the Greek Orthodox Cathedral into a Roman Catholic Church until 1261. So initially for 667 years, it was a Greek Orthodox Cathedral. Then after that, for 57 years, from 1204 to 1261, for 57 years, it was the Roman Catholic Church. Again later on, when the Christian Byzantines came to power, it was again converted back into a Greek Orthodox Cathedral until the Ottoman rulers, until Sultan Muhammad Fateh, he conquered Constantinople in 1453. Then it was converted into a mosque. So since 537 up to 1453 for more than 900 years it remained a Greek Orthodox Cathedral then for a few years it was the Roman Catholic Church then went back to become a Greek Orthodox Cathedral and it was the largest church in the world where it was built the biggest in-house covering and the dome was the largest it remained larger for a thousand years until 1500 when a new church was made. In 1453, Sultan Muhammad Fateh, he conquers Constantinople and then there are documents available that he purchases the Hagia Sophia and after purchasing it, he converts it into a mosque. It remains a mosque till 1931 until Mustafa Kamal Ataturk, he takes over Turkey and he declares it as a secular state. For four years it was closed and he passes a verdict in 1934 that the mosque should be converted into a museum. And since 1935 till today, 2020 July, that's the 11th of July, it remained a museum until today and all these years for about 85 years there were many cases saying that why the Hagia Sophia a museum because Ataturk declared it that this is a sign of secularism that we want to make it into a museum it will not be a church it will not be a mosque and since that there were many cases that have been filed that it is wrong that it was converted into a museum and recently the council in Turkey, the highest administrative court, it passed a resolution that it was illegal for Mustafa Kamal Ataturk to convert into a museum. And today, mashallah, the court of Turkey has given a verdict and has said that it was illegal for Ataturk to convert it into a museum. And Alhamdulillah, Erdogan, after the court verdict, he signed a resolution that this structure, Hagia Sophia, which was earlier a church, then became a mosque, then a museum, it will be transferred from the Department of Tourism and it will go to the Department of Religious Authority of Turkey. Now, this has created a lot of controversy and today, if you read the newspapers, and the media, they are disagreeing with the decision taken by Turkey, by the Turkish government, by Erdogan, and you find right from USA, Trump, Russia, 
Greece, all of them condemning it is wrong. UNESCO, many non-Muslim organizations. And you find the media that they disagreed, they've been threatened and said it is wrong. But the saddest part, what I read in the media, that there were many Muslim countries and many so-called Muslim dais and Muslim scholars from the Western countries said what Turkey did and what Erdogan did is wrong. And to support their claim, they said that we know in history the Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he was asked to pray in Jerusalem. He did not pray. He said, if he prays there, people will make a mosque and then he prayed somewhere else and the Masjid Aqsa was made. And all this is about how we encourage and have a relationship. And they quoted the verse of the Quran, Surah Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 40, saying it is not permitted to destroy uh, synagogues or the church and Quran is against it. And I was shocked to read the views of many of the Muslim guys from the Western countries and from the Arab world saying it is wrong. What are my views regarding what Turkey did is correct or not or what Erdogan did is right or wrong? As far as my views are concerned, the hadith quoted and the incidents quoted by the Muslims regarding Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that he did not pray and he paid some wells and there were treaties between Muslims and others that your lives are safe and your places of worship are safe and Muslims will not enter your places of worship. All these references are when there is a treaty between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. As I mentioned in the first answer to the first question that can a holy place, a church or a temple be converted to a mosque? After it is conquered, the answer is yes. Only if there is a treaty between the Muslims and the non-Muslims or if the non-Muslims surrender or they are dhimmis, non-Muslim living under the law of the Muslim rule, Islamic rule, that is the only condition where the Muslims give them security and they are paying a jazia. As far as when the Uthman rulers, when they conquered Constantinople, it was a conquest. It was a war. So it is wrong to give examples of a treaty between the Muslims and non-Muslims and say that same way Turkey should manage it. It's totally wrong. So if there is a conquest, if there is a war and if the Muslims rule, and this is a common law all over the world. We find so many non-Muslim rulers, when they conquer the land, they occupy the mosque. Many of them demolish the mosque. You have example of the Crusaders. The best example is Spain. There were hundreds of mosques and most of them were either converted to churches or they were made into museums or they were destroyed. Hardly you find there was not a Muslim who could openly give the azan. Why don't people object to that? So this was the normal law that once you conquer, that becomes your land. So once it becomes your land, you have a right to do what you want to do. Later on, after World War I, World War II, then the Geneva Convention, all that is later on. So before that, the rule was once you conquer a land, it becomes part of your land and you can do what you feel is right. So based on that, this was the conquest done by Sultan Muhammad Fateh. And in the conquest, they have a right to keep the house of worship, to convert into a mosque. It is a right and you find several examples. In fact, if you read the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad I'll give you one incident which I don't want to give it, but to reply to these Muslims who are attacking Turkey and attacking Erdogan, that if we read the seer of the Prophet, if we know in the seer of the Prophet, when Muhammad migrated to Medina and later on he came back to Makkah, during Fateh Makkah, what did he do? When he came back with about 10,000 Sahabas and it was a victory, the first thing he did was he went to Kaaba, which was a house of worship of the non-Muslims. There were 360 idols in Kaaba. He went in the Kaaba and recited the verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says that وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْوَ ذَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ الزَّوْقَ When truth is hurled in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. And he destroyed all the idols. Imagine today if the non-Muslims object and say, what did it is wrong? Will the Muslims agree to them? It was a house of worship of the non-Muslims, right or wrong? Yes. But it was a conquest. Though it was a bloodless conquest, it was an easy thing. Once they ruled the land, they destroyed the idols. 
And that is in Islamic history. So do you mean to say what Prophet Muhammad did is wrong? And many may not be aware that Makkah is also mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Bible in the book of Psalms, chapter number 84, verse number 5 to 7, it says, Blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakka. And the same Bakka, the word is also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 96, which says, the first place of worship, the first house of worship of Allah was Bakka. Same word what the Quran mentions for Makkah, Bakka is also mentioned in the Christian Bible. Imagine today the Christian say that Makkah belongs to the Christian and the Muslims should give it to them. Will the Muslims believe? Will the Muslims agree? And the answer is no. Imagine someone comes with a bright idea that let us convert the haram into a museum. Will the Muslims believe? Will the Muslims agree? And the answer is no. So what you have to realize, at that time this was the law. And at that time, you see the seerah of the Prophet. What did he do? What happened today, many of the Muslims are being influenced by the Western culture. Because they are staying in Western countries, they want to change the Islamic history. They want to give a ruling. They quote verses from the Quran. And the verse of the Quran that was quoted of Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 40, we say that, Quran says that house of worship should not be destroyed. There is no verse in the Quran saying that. It is a misunderstanding. If you want to know the real context, start from verse number 1 before. Surah Hajj, chapter number 24, verse number 39 says that you are permitted to fight against those non-Muslims who have done wrong. And Allah will aid you and protect you. This is the first verse of the Quran giving permission for the Muslims when they migrate from Makkah to Medina to fight against the non-Muslims. First verse. Then verse number 40 of Surah Hajj, chapter number 22 says that and those who leave their homes because they say that our Lord is one, Allah is one. And it continues that if Allah wouldn't have checked one force with the other, then the churches and the synagogues and the mosques where the name of Allah is taken would have been destroyed. It doesn't say that it is not permitted to destroy. It's telling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one it's telling, it is giving permission for the Muslims to fight against the non-Muslims who have done wrong, who have done transgression. And then it says that those Muslims who leave their home because they believe in Tawheed, believe in one God, Allah is there to protect you. And then it says, if Allah wouldn't have checked one group against the other, then the places of worship, like the synagogue, like the church, like the mosque, that would have been destroyed. Giving indication doesn't say that you cannot destroy. For knowing the real meaning, go to the tafasir. And if you read Qurtubi, Qurtubi says very clearly that what I said in the reply to the first answer, that if there is a treaty between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, if the non-Muslims become dhimmi under the rule of the Muslim rulers, if they agree that the Muslims are the rulers, or if they surrender, and there's no conquest and if they are paying jazia, if they are paying a tax for protection, it becomes the duty of the Muslims to protect the lives of the non-Muslim, the dhimmi, to protect the homes and protect the house of worship. But, again Kurdubi says, you cannot build a new house of worship for the non-Muslim because it is sin. But what is there, it can remain. They cannot expand it also. So if there is a treaty or if the non-Muslims have surrendered. In this case, yes. You cannot occupy it. You protect the house of worship, but cannot build a new one, cannot expand it. But in conquest, if there is a war, and if the conqueror is there, then it is the right of the Muslim ruler to do what he wants because that becomes part of his land. So please don't quote some hadith which is out of context. And there are several hadith of the beloved Prophet Muhammad where he told the Sahaba that go and destroy the idols. Several. He has told Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, go and destroy the idols. There are several. He has told Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, go and destroy the idols. There are several. Several hadith in Bukhari, in Muslim. Muhammad himself destroyed the idols in Makkah. So please, I would like to request the Muslims that by giving answers, a general common Muslim who may not be aware of the context will agree with the views given by 
such scholars, which is totally wrong. Is there any scholar, Islamic scholar, who can deny that the Prophet broke the idols? Is there any Islamic scholar who can deny that the Prophet told Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, the fourth caliph of Islam, told Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, and many of the Sahabat then go and deface the idols? There is one more hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 3020, as well as Sahih Muslim, hadith number 2476, where Jarir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the Sahabas, he says that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he called me and he told me that will you relieve for me the Dhul Khalsa? What is Dhul Khalsa? Dhul Khalsa was the place of worship of the non-Muslims in Yemen. It was also called the Kaaba Tul Yaminiya. Kaaba Tul Yaminiya means the Kaaba of the Yemen. And in it, there were idols. He said, will you do a favor for me? Will you destroy it for me? Then Jarir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, he takes with him 150 horsemen and he burns down that house of worship. It's a hadith, a sahih hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. I don't want to tell this, but it is there. That means the Prophet commanded not only to destroy the idols, he even asked them to destroy the place of worship. So when the Muslims are conquering and when they rule that land, it is permitted even to destroy the place of worship. Now this, if you say Quran says you should not destroy churches and synagogues, do you think the Prophet went against the Quran? The context is wrong. That is when there is the treaty between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, when they are dhimmi, when they are under the rule of the Muslims. But generally, it is a fard to destroy the idols if the Muslim conquers the land. And if there are idols, it becomes a fard. And you have several examples of Sahabas doing that. It is umpteen number of hadiths are there. So to try and misguide telling that it is not permissible is totally wrong. But destroying the temples or the house of worship is not a fard. But if required, if it's causing a problem for the Muslim Ummah, the Prophet has commanded that. So how can you say it's not permitted? So what I would like to say that many a time Muslims living in the Western country or even some of the Muslims in the Arab land, you know, trying to be soft to the non-Muslims and trying that they are the one who will support them, they are the one who are going to fund them, etc. They are going to protect them. Many a time they give verdict which is against the Quran and the Sunnah. Be careful. If you are going to go against our Muslim brother, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, or against a Muslim country, there are hardly few people today, Muslim leaders, who can really try and revive the Sunnah. And as I said in my earlier answer, that I don't know of any Muslim leader which is anyway close to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or anyway close to the Khulfa Rashid in the way they ruled or how they were political leaders. No way close, not even one person. Now if one Muslim brother is doing something which is there, which is permitted, why are the Muslims against him? So as far as my view is concerned, Alhamdulillah what Turkey did is completely correct. And if you agree that Muhammad Fateh Sultan, he purchased the mosque. Today we know there are hundreds and thousands of churches in different parts of the world, in the Western countries, in UK, in Europe, in America, which have been purchased by the Muslim organization. If you say that after you purchase, you can't make it into the mosque, that means the Muslim living in the Western country will have to give up all these mosques as to the church. If few centuries back, Emperor Sultan Muhammad Fateh purchases, buys with his own money, and that was one of the reasons. So here we are not talking about conquest. It is purchased. We are not talking about war. It's permitted. After war you can convert it. Here he purchased it. There are documents. So the court in Turkey said, seeing as the documents, if there was a case filed, that what right does Kamal Ataturk have to convert into a museum? The highest authority in Turkey. It's a legal verdict said what is done by Ataturk is wrong. Now, what is bothering USA or Russia or Greece? How can they object? How can they interfere in the personal affairs of Turkey, a Muslim country? And why are the other Muslims supporting the non-Muslims? It is totally wrong. As far as I am concerned, whatever Turkey did is correct. It is permitted in Islam. It is Mustafa, alhamdulillah. It was a mosque for several years. It was purchased. If I don't support them now, I'll have to tell all the thousands of mosques in the European country and in USA and in Canada, which have been purchased from the church authorities. 
Even they have to give them up. So please, Allah clearly says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, that, Ya you Amun, O you believe, stand out for justice, as true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, whether rich or poor, Allah protects both. So please, if a Muslim has the guts to do something, which is close to Quran and Sunnah, it's the duty as Muslims that we should support him and we should encourage him. Hope that answers the question. The second question from Dr. Ahmad Nisar, Lahore, Pakistan. Is it permissible for a Muslim state, Muslim government, to build temple or church from government expenses? A similar question asked by Amir Wasim from Islamabad, Pakistan. If we have a controversy here over the construction of a Hindu temple in Islamabad with the taxpayers' money by the government. Muslim clerics are opposing it here. Can a temple be built with Muslim taxpayers' money in an Islamic state? And this is another controversy that is there in the past couple of weeks regarding the government of Pakistan funding in the construction of a Hindu temple in Islamabad. And this controversy is there for the last couple of weeks. Is it permissible or not? It is unanimous amongst all the four ahimmas. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, all the fuqahs unanimously say that a Muslim cannot donate his money for the construction of a house of worship of the non-Muslim. Cannot donate, cannot build, cannot support. Several fatwas. You see the fatwa from classical scholars, from the medieval scholars, that it is not permitted for a Muslim to build a church or a temple or give donation to build a church or a temple or any place of worship of the non-Muslims. Based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, we says that you have to cooperate with one another in birra wa taqwa. Taun al birra wa taqwa. That means you have to help one another for righteousness and piety. And this is the common verse which most of the Muslims know. But the verse continues and says that but you should not cooperate. You should not help one another in sin and transgression. You cannot help anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, in doing a sin. And the biggest sin in Islam is shirk, is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can a Muslim donate or support in building a house of worship of the non-Muslims. Regarding the question, can a Muslim government contribute or pay from the tax pays money? And the answer is no. If it's a Muslim country and if it is according to the rules of the Sharia, of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, it is haram for any Muslim or a Muslim government to pay or donate to a house of worship of the non-Muslim. In fact, when a fatwa was asked, to Imam Abu Hanifa and to the other Ahmas that if a Muslim bequeaths in his inheritance that let part of my wealth or one third of my wealth be donated to make a temple, it is not permitted at all or a church. Even if you bequeath, you write in your will that let one third of my wealth be donated to build a house of worship with a non-Muslim, it is haram, it should not be followed. Even if a non-Muslim living in a Muslim country bequeaths that let my wealth be used for the building of a temple or the building of a church, it should not be followed. And this is unanimous amongst all the fuqahs. Even you cannot use the non-Muslim money to build a temple in a Muslim land. So where is the question of using Muslim money or taxpayers money? Even if the non-Muslim wills give a wasiyah, as I mentioned earlier, that if a Muslim has a treaty with the non-Muslim and the non-Muslim agrees that he comes under the rulership of the Muslim ruler and he signs the contract, then he becomes a dhimmi, he becomes a non-Muslim under the rule of a Muslim law and then he pays a jazia. In that condition only, the Muslim ruler protects that house of worship, whether it be a temple or a church. But he cannot spend money even in innovation on it. 
He cannot spend money even in expanding it. And if a Muslim ruler expands place of house of worship of non-Muslim, there is full right to destroy that part which is expanded. Even though he's a dhimmi. There is no permission for him to build a new temple or a new church for the non-Muslims. Only what exists, he can protect it. That's all. So if Pakistan calls itself to be a country which is following the Quran as the constitution, and if the Muslim ulamas and the shiuks, whether it be Darul Ulub Deoband, whether it be Markaz al Hadith, they have objected, of course they are right. I'm completely with them. I'm completely with the scholars in objecting that how can Pakistan spend the government money in making a temple? The maximum they can do is whatever temple existed, they can keep them, that's it. They cannot contribute and that's the reason. You know there are Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia where it's not permitted to build any house of worship of the non-Muslim and this is Islam. You cannot. If it's there, existing there, it is there, okay. In some Muslim countries, knows Billah, they are donating land for building temples. Some Muslim countries, they are funding tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in building house of worship of non-Muslims. This is totally against Islam, against the teaching of Quran and Sunnah. So what the Muslim ulamas and the shaykhs in Pakistan are doing, objecting to the act done by the Pakistan government, I'm with them, I completely support them, and this should be stopped. Hope that answers the question. We have on the Facebook Rohit Patel, MashaAllah, Ahmed Khalid, Masood Sheikh, Muhammad Yunus Kabir, Waqar Ahmed, Masood Ahmed, Abdul Yusuf, Parveen Muzamdar, Anik Adala Justice, Saud Hashmi, Tabassum Mohiddin, Sayyid Al Nath Sheikh, Muhammad Abdullah, Atif Nazir, Faiza Saria, Muhammad Arif Khan, Sadiur Rahman, all this on the Facebook, and most of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Wa Rahmatullah Barakatuh, telling duas for me, and I do duas for you too. We have on the YouTube Kaiser Muhammad, Stat Race, Turkar Zanikil, Hassan Mustafa, Mahnoor Fazal, Rahman Khan, Javid Meer, Taufik Ali, Amna Masood, Tanvir, TM Rayan, Yaya Salman. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, bless all of you. The third question is from Abdul Jabbar from Hyderabad, India. I completely agree with your reply given in the previous session that Muslims must not migrate from Muslim countries to non-Muslim countries for a better living. I also agree with most part of your reply regarding Muslim living in non-Muslim countries, especially Western countries, should mostly migrate to a Muslim country. What are your views regarding Muslims living in India since India was previously ruled by Muslims? And I would like to thank Brother Abdul Jabbar for asking this question. He's referring to the reply I gave in my last session, where a person asked that, is it permissible for a Muslim to migrate from Muslim country to a non-Muslim country for a better living? And I will just repeat in short, and I said it is not permissible for a Muslim to migrate from a Muslim country to a non-Muslim country for a better living, unless it is for education he can do for that couple of years of education and come back, or if he wants to do dawa and he wants to become a full-time dai, going as a dai and giving dawa in a non-Muslim country is permissible, but for no other reason, for a better living or so that you can get more money or you can have a luxurious life. Besides these two reasons, for a better living or anything else, it is not permissible for Muslims to leave a Muslim country and go to a non-Muslim country, especially referring to the Western country. And then I went further to say that the verse of the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 97, where Allah Subhanahu says that the angel comes to take the life of the person who had died in sin, that how was your state? And he said that we were weak and oppressed. Then the angel replies that the earth of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is vast, so why didn't you migrate? And those who do not do that, Allah says, they will go to hell and the refuge will be evil. So based on this, there are three options 
for a Muslim living in a non-Muslim country. And I gave the reply that Muslim living in non-Muslim countries, especially referring to the Western countries, that if they cannot live openly, declaring themselves to be Muslims, or cannot practice some of the Islamic aspects, or they cannot practice most of it, or some of it, it becomes further for them to migrate to Muslim land. The second category, those Muslims living in a non-Muslim country where they can freely practice Islam, and they have no problem at all, and they can call themselves Muslim, they can do all the faraiz, there's no restriction at all. I don't know any such country. There may be parts of some country, but as a whole, I don't know. Some countries may be better than the others. But if such a situation is there, then it is not compulsory for them to migrate to a Muslim country, it is mustahab. That means they can stay, but yet better is to migrate. And the third condition is if the Muslim is oppressed, or they are weak, or they cannot migrate, then Allah will forgive them. This was my answer of three categories. But now the brothers posed the question, what about India? The Muslims living in India, because India was ruled by the Muslims for more than a thousand years. So does India also come in the same category as a Muslim country? And that's a very important question. And Jazakallah for asking this question. There are some countries, and one of the good examples is India, that India was ruled for a thousand years. And the population of India, approximately more than one third, about 40% of them were Muslims. Then the British has come and they come saying that they don't do business but they want to control India, they started ruling India and then when they left, they created a division among the Indians who were living very peacefully. Even though the Muslims ruled India for about a thousand years, the Mughal, if the Muslim rulers would have forced the non-Muslim to accept Islam, there would not have been any non-Muslims alive in India. Many accepted Islam because they liked Islam. Many people remained as non-Muslims and there was no problem. But the Britishers, they had a policy of divide and rule. So when they left, they divided India into three parts. And they divided the Muslims especially. And one third of the Muslims went to Pakistan, one third went in India, one third went to Bangladesh. They didn't give one country, they gave two countries. And Bangladesh and Pakistan, which were known West Pakistan, East Pakistan, they split. So now Muslims are divided into three. In India, a little bit more than one-third remained, maybe about 37, 38, 39 percent remained in India. One-third went to Pakistan, about 33 percent. Less than one-third went to Bangladesh, about 29, 30 percent. But if you add all together, Muslims are 40 percent. Now when partition took place, India declared itself to be a secular country. It didn't declare itself to be a Hindu country. And when the constitution was laid down, it had a special rule. It was a secular country and it said that any citizen of India following any religion, that law of that religion will apply as far as civil cases are concerned. So if Muslims are living in India, they had a separate law and today also they have known as the Muslim personal law. The Christian have their Christian law, the Hindus they have their Hindu law. So when this was drafted, it gave permission for all the religions to practice their religion freely. All the citizens of India. India was not at all a Hindu country and even today it is not. It is a secular country, it is a democratic country and it said that any citizen of India, whichever religion he belongs to, can live here peacefully. So based on that, India is a unique case in the world where Muslim ruled for a thousand years. And today also according to me, the majority of Muslims in any country in the world, number one is India. Though statistic-wise it says number one is Indonesia, about 220, 230 million Muslims. Number two is India, some about 200 million. Some people say that it is Pakistan, about 202 million. And third is Pakistan. Some say second is Pakistan, third is India, and then fourth is Bangladesh. According to me, the Indian government doesn't declare the correct number of Muslims. They don't count many millions of Muslims in Assam, etc. I feel according to me, minimum Muslims would be 250 to 300 million today. So according to me, the country which has maximum number of Muslims living in any part of the world, number one is India, then is Indonesia, then is Pakistan. The number of Muslims in India would be minimum 250 million, can even go up to 300 million. Now, when the partition took place, the government that was formed in India, the constitution says that every citizen of India has the right to preach, practice and propagate his religion. And it is just about four years back that I left my country and for more than 20 years, mashallah, 
for about 25 years. I did Dava openly, large audiences, and India has been a very safe place for the Muslims. It is recently when the BJP government came to power, just hardly six years back in 2014, that the problem started. Previously, the problems were minor, and the Muslim could live peacefully. There was no major problems at all. The politician, Hindu politician, meaning the BJP, which is a part of the RSS, these are fanatics and faces. And they started promoting the Hindu Twa and trying to misguide the people. And now there are problems created for the Muslims. But generally, for the Muslims living in India, it is very close to living in a Muslim country. They have their full rights. So Muslims living in India, it is perfectly permissible for them to live. Such close example is, for example, Singapore. Singapore first was part of Malaysia, where two-thirds of the citizens of Malaysia, they were Muslims. Previously were everything, later on, the non-Muslims came. And then Singapore became separate. And today Singapore has about 18 or 20 percent Muslims. So there also they have a Muslim personal law for the Muslims. So Singapore is also somewhere close to India. But naturally, the freedom in India is much more than freedom in Singapore. So there are certain few more countries like that, maybe Mauritius or some which may have a Muslim personal law. So in such countries, India is one of the best amongst these countries. In these countries where there is a Muslim personal law, where you can follow. I don't know of any Western country where a Muslim can follow Muslim personal law. Only the criminal law is common in India and these countries. But in the Western countries, certain things the Muslims are permitted. For example, they are allowed to have halls of worship, but they cannot marry according to the Islamic law. They cannot have more than one wife. The nikah is not valid, the divorce is not according to the Islamic Sharia, inherit is not according to Islamic Sharia, you can will it, that's a different case. And neither can you openly practice your deen as you can do in India. Yes, there are some non-Muslim countries which are better than the other non-Muslim countries. So my answer was basically talking about non-Muslim countries, mainly the Western countries and the other non-Muslim country. So India will come close to a Muslim country, not fully like a Muslim country. It's not required for the Muslims in India to migrate. They can live and you have a lot of history of Muslims. And if you see the structure that I've created and a rich source of Islamic knowledge is there in India. So, but natural, Jazakallah for asking the question, this is a different case altogether, like in India and other few countries of the world. Hope that answers the question. The fourth question is from Sohag Ahmed. Sir, please debate with David Woods or say something to him as he says lot of rubbish things about you and other Islamic scholars. This person, Sohag Ahmed and few other Muslim brothers have been continuously asking this question that oh why Dr. Zakin Naik not debating with David Woods and, and they keep on asking this question several times. And I didn't think it was important, but now finally I've taken the question to give them the reason. First, you have to understand that anyone that challenges a person, it's not required that you should accept the challenge. As far as you realize, there are many non-Muslims who are becoming famous just by trying to criticize a popular person. Generally, it's a general rule whether Muslim or non-Muslim, if he criticizes a popular personality or a celebrity, that person becomes famous. This is a common thing. It's nothing new. So because of that, David Woods is one of the Christians who has spoken against me and spoken against some of the other Muslim scholars and tries to challenge them. Why I have not accepted such challenges? The reason is that, first of all, we should not give publicity to such people. That is the reason I didn't want to answer this question. Then I thought of answering the question without taking the name of David Woods. If you go to David Woods' YouTube, you find that he has spoken against me. And those videos that made against me get views more than a million or close to a million. So we are giving him free publicity. There was a time when I was involved in the Dawah in my initial stages in the early 90s. And the internet was new. In the mid 90s, the internet was new. And when I went to America in the mid-90s, one of the first sites that was against Muslims was Answering Islam. And the person who used to run this site was Joshin Katz. 
And that time we were new in the field of Dawah and when anyone wrote against Islam, I used to go out of the way and reply to them. Anyone wrote against me, I used to reply to them. And then I realized the moment we reply to them, we have another 10 counter questions. So what we realized that my positive work is being stopped. If really that question is a logical question or a question that deserves a reply, should be replied. But these frivolous arguments, at that time when I was new, I told Josh and Katz that, okay, do you want to debate with me? You are writing against Islam. He said, do you think I am a fool to debate with Dr. Zakir Naik? That was his reply. So if you see in the initial stages of my dawah in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, I had many debates. And then I realized that debating is not the best, it should be done when required. But better is to talk about, give lectures on similarities between Islam and Christianity, similarity between Islam and Hinduism. But when required, yes. And one of the best debaters in the world, you know, was Sheikh Ahmad Didar. But then we realized that there were people who started challenging me. And one such person was from USA again. I'll tell you his name. Sam Shamoon. Sam Shamoon. And when I went to Chicago, I met him. He said, oh, I want to debate with you. I said, send your guru. And then I had a debate with his guru, Dr. William Campbell. And when I accepted this debate, I was called by the students of USA that Dr. William Campbell wrote a book, Quran and Bible in the Light of Science. And he took out about 30 scientific errors in the Quran. And for eight years, no Muslim replied. So this book was doing a great damage for the Dawah of the Muslims. And no one replied, so I took up the challenge. I read the book and I went and I debated with it. And Alhamdulillah, in Chicago, there were two groups among the Muslims. One group was against the debate. What is this? No one replied. And now the Zakir, who is this young man coming from India? How will he reply? So half the Muslims were against the debate and half the Muslims were for. Alhamdulillah, the debate took place in Chicago and Allah's help was there. Allah's mercy was there and it was a very successful debate. So much so that after that, Alhamdulillah, William Campbell, who got a doctorate in writing a book against Islam, mashallah, it lost its popularity. Later on then, I made a policy that after my video started becoming popular, then I had a rule. I will only debate with those people who are popular. Then we realized that those people who are not popular started challenging to become popular. And I'll give you a very good example. You know, Sheikh Ahmed Didad, he debated with Jimmy Swagat. And Jimmy Swag at that time was one of the most popular televangelists. He was multiple times more popular than Sheikh Ahmed Didad. Many people told him, don't go, he will chew you and spit you. But Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Ahmed Didad had the help of Allah and he gave a knockout to Jimmy Swag. We have another example, he debated with Anis Surosh. Anis Surosh wasn't known at all. But when Anis Surosh debated with Sheikh Ahmed Didad, Ahmed Didad, Alhamdulillah, won him lock, stock and barrel. But Anis Soroj became popular. So what we realize that when you debate with someone who's popular and an unpopular person debates with a popular person, the unpopular person becomes famous overnight. So why should we make the unpopular Christian missionaries as popular? So then I had a policy that anyone who wants to debate with me should minimum have at least 2% of the audience that I have in my largest gathering. And earlier I said that anyone who can gather 10,000 people individually for a lecture, I will debate him. After that, there was a middle person who requested him to debate with Shishi Ravi Shankar. And you know Shishi Ravi Shankar is one of the most famous Hindu preachers in the world. One of the most. It comes the number one, two and three. And he has a large following. He has an audience of 20,000, 50,000, Alhamdulillah. I accept it. The challenge and we had a debate in the year 2006 in January in his hometown Bangalore and Allah's help was there. It was a very successful debate. The topic was concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures. Since 2006, there are many people who challenge me for a debate. And when anyone challenges me, I say that I don't waste my time. There are hundreds of people who address large audiences, they are very popular and my largest gathering that I have given a lecture is 
previously was in Kerala, then it was in Kishan Ganj, Bihar, where more than a million people attended. So 2% of a million is 20,000. So my criteria was I would not mind debating any non-Muslim on any topic of comparative religion as long as he can gather minimum 20,000 people for his live lecture, not a conference. In conferences, there are 20, 30 speakers. They might not have come for him particularly. So if a person gives a solo lecture and if he can get audience of 20,000 people live, not on the YouTube, not on the Facebook, 20,000 live sitting, then I don't mind debating him. And what I'm asking is not something which is difficult. There are hundreds of Hindu preachers in India who have audience in more than 20,000. There are hundreds of Christian missionaries who have audience in more than 20,000. So I tell if people like Sam Shamoon or people like David Woods want to have a debate, let them become popular. Why do they want to ride on my bandwagon? And if you can't get that gathering, only thing you have to do is convince with your material any other Christian preacher, there are many. Franklin Graham is there, Billy Graham is there, Maurice Sorolo is there. There are many. There are hundred speakers that I know in Christianity who have given live lectures to more than 20,000 people. What you have to do is catch one of them and convince them that your material against me is logical and give it to them. I will have a debate with them. Why should I make you famous overnight? I heard one or two of his videos that Zakir and Nike is a joke. It is. What he's talking is rubbish. But the moment I reply to him, he becomes famous. That's the reason I was avoiding handling this question because now the moment I take the name of David Woods, most of the people hearing me tonight may not be aware of David Woods. A small percentage maybe. They will go and check. He will become famous. And let me tell you, there are many other people my students who can debate, there was a dai by the name of Muhammad Hijab. And he came to meet me in Malaysia last year. And he's a fan of mine, he's a good dai. He personally had a debate with David Woods. I have not seen the video, I was supposed to watch. But some of my colleagues saw it and they told that Brother Muhammad Hijab, he gave David Woods a knockout. So when others can do the job, why should I waste my time? That's the reason previously we used to reply on the internet. Now we don't. Because the moment you reply, they'll give a counter reply and your work of positive dawah suffers. So that's the reason anyone who wants to debate me, this criteria is there, give it to a celebrity, give it to a famous personality, he will not be a fool to debate with me. Today, if someone gives a million dollar to Shishi Ravi Shankar, he will never agree to have a debate with me again. He knows that. Even if you give two million dollars to him, he will not. Because he's a celebrity, he will lose his following and he already lost many, many people in that debate who were his followers who called him God, they accepted Islam. So that's the reason I require David Wood to convince any of these hundred Christian missionaries who are popular, who can have audience of more than 20, so convince them. If he cannot convince them, why does he want to have a debate with them? When he cannot convince his own Christian brother that the material of his is enough to answer my lectures, why is he wasting his time? These people are only riding on the popularity of other people. Otherwise, he's unknown. And I request the Muslim brothers, please don't waste your time. Please don't waste your time. The person who asked me this question should have, in fact, known that Brother Muhammad Hijab, he had a debate with him and I already answered him. So why should you make David Wood popular? So hope this answers the question. And because I made this criteria since 2006, in the last 14 years, no one has ever wanted to debate me. One of the fans of Sadhguru told me, will you debate Sadhguru? And Sadhguru is a popular person, is not as popular as Shishi Ravi Shankar, but he's popular. I told, okay, I accept it, I know he's popular. Okay, if he wants to debate with me, I'm not interested in debating him. He wants to debate, he wants to speak against Islam, wants to challenge me, I'll accept it. Because if he challenges me, and if Allah's help is there, and we present the truth and answer to all, his illogical arguments, but naturally he will lose his following. So if people like Sadhguru or someone who's popular want to challenge on any topic of Islam and comparative religion which I deal with, I accept the challenge. Hope that answers the question. You have on the Facebook Muhammad Arif Khan, Talal Rohayim, 
سعودی ہاشمی فیضہ سریا عاطف نذیر محمد عبداللہ سعید النت شیح تبسم محی الدین افضل اسلام شبلو سعود ہاشمی عدالت جسٹس انک احمد انک السلام علیکم ماشاء اللہ الحمد للہ پروین مسمبر عادل عطف یوسف جیسمن مصطفیٰ منڈل یو آر گریٹ روہت پٹیل ماشاء اللہ وعلیکم السلام مے اللہ بلیس آل آف یو آن دو یوٹیوب یو ہیو گجندر سنگھ ذاکر صدیقی سیف بالی تونی بھی نیحال تیاش رینڈم کیسف کشور صوفیا صوفیا صدیا فردوس بالی جونتن سیف صبا عرفت السلام علیکم علیکم السلام وی ایو آن دا فیس بک سم کمنٹ فرام محمد سمان اسلامک سپر ہیرو منی لیریکل لو یو اینڈ طیب اردوغان محمد سمون یو آر دا ریئل ہیرو آف اسلام حسن ورد الحق السلام علیکم سر آئی ایم فرام انڈیا یو آر ریئلی امیزنگ دا نیکسٹ کوشچن از فرام عبد القادر کبیر فرام نائجیریا دا قرآن مینشن دیٹ اٹس اللہ ہو گائڈز ہوم ہی ولز اینڈ لیڈز اسٹرے ہوم ہی ولز اف اللہ از دا ون ہو گائڈز دین ہاؤ کین ہی پنش دا ونز ہو الڈ اسٹرے اینڈ دیٹس اے ویری گڈ کوشچن asked by Abdul Qadir. What he's referring to is the verse of the Quran from Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 4, that it's Allah who guides who he wishes and he leads us to who he wishes. So based on the verse of the Quran, the question is posing then how can Allah punish those people who have gone astray, if Allah is the one who leads us astray. Before I give the answer, I'd like to give an example that if there is a teacher who is teaching the class and telling the students that this is the portion of the examination and the teaches the complete portion of a particular subject, gives the textbook, the rules and regulation. And there's one student who's very intelligent, who comes and asks the teacher questions, the teacher clarifies, gives the student more time. There's another student who bunks the classes, who keeps on teasing the teacher in the classroom, doesn't obey the teacher, criticizes the teacher, doesn't ask any question. But as the teacher realizes that that student who's intelligent and asking questions and, and which teacher has guided him is bound to score good marks in the examination. And the student who plays hooky and who criticizes the teacher, doesn't listen to the teacher, is bound to fail. After a year, the examination takes place and the teacher gives first class first to the first student and fails the student who was playing hooky, who was not interested in studies, who criticized the teacher. Can a third student say that the teacher is not just first student, the teacher supported, answered the question and passed him and gave him first class first. The second student didn't help him and failed him. It is illogical. Because the first student went out of his way to ask questions and clarify whatever he didn't understand, the teacher answered, which is even the second student could have done that. The second student neither asked any question, criticized, went against the commandments of the teacher, he's bound to fail. So how can you blame the teacher that why did the teacher fail him? Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, Chapter number 67, verse number 2. Allah the khalakal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life is a test for the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down the rules and regulations for the human beings in the glorious Quran. The rules and regulations, how a human being should follow the commandments of Allah, he has sent several revelations. But the last and final revelation, which is available in the authentic form, in the original form, is the glorious Quran. And for details, you have to refer to the hadith of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Allah further says in the Quran, in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that all those who strive, do jihad, 
strive and struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up his pathways. Allah says in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 28, but Allah will not guide those who do transgression and those who tell lies. So Allah is very clear that those who strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up his pathways and put them in Jannah. All those who do transgression and do sin and who lie, Allah will not guide them. So those people who are misguided are not following the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Similarly, the example of the teacher that a student who wants to learn more, ask questions and strives to know more knowledge is the example of Surah Ankabut chapter 29 verse 69 that those who strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up the pathways and put them in Jannah. So those people who are not obeying the commandments, why should Allah guide them? So Allah is right. He will lead astray some people who he wishes and he will guide some people who he wishes. Allah is not arbid. Okay, fine, you look handsome, I will guide you. You don't look handsome, I will not guide you. No, there are rules and regulations. That if you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will guide you. If you don't follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you do transgression, if you do sin, if you do shirk, Allah will not guide you. So what is illogical? So why are you blaming the teacher when she or he fails the student? So your also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not guiding him because he's doing sin. And a person who does sin and strives and asks for forgiveness, Allah takes him out from darkness to light. Verses of the Quran. Allah takes a person from darkness to light. Those who have the desire to follow the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they sin, if they ask for forgiveness, Allah will forgive them. Allah will lead them to the straight path. But those people who abuse Allah, who do shirk, who don't follow his commandments, surely he will lead them astray. Leading astray means they will go to Jahannam. So this is totally logical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, number 40, Allah is never unjust in the least degree. Hope that answers the question. The next question from Ansari from India. My Hindu friend considers both Islam and Hinduism to be true religions. Will he go to paradise? The question posed by the brother was that my Hindu friend considers Islam and Hinduism both to be true religions. Will he go to paradise? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear cut. He clearly gives the message in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19. In Naddina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. It's submitting only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And he will be amongst the losers in the Akhirah. So as far as religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent only one religion for humankind. During the passage of time, when he sent a revelation, he sent a messenger, the revelation got corrupted, people disobeyed the messenger, Allah sent a new revelation, Allah sent a new messenger. Again, people deviated, Allah sent a new messenger. There were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 38, in every age has he sent a revelation. There are many revelations by name four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil and the Quran. Torah is the wahi, the revelation that was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi, the revelation given to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What we realize that religion is only one. Even though the scriptures have changed, there are remnants of Tawheed and about coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what I do, I talk about the similarity between Islam and Hinduism, Islam and Christianity. When I talk about similarity, it doesn't mean that Hinduism is totally right. I am telling that if you believe the Vedas to be the word of God, I believe the Quran to be the word of God. Let us agree to follow what is common. So when we do a comparative study, based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, we say, Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa im bainu Come to common terms as with us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Here we come to know that all the religions, the scriptures evidently talk about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, monotheism. Talks about the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I tell them that if you believe in the word of God, why don't you believe in one God? Why don't you worship him alone? Why do you make idols of that God? 
why don't you believe in the last and final messenger so telling you partly believe in some teachings of hinduism because it matches with islam no problem at all but you say completely believe in hinduism i can give a longer lecture on difference between hinduism and islam but that's not my purpose so anyone who says i believe both in hinduism and islam completely it can't be possible he believes that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almighty god and he believes in the false teaching of christianity that jesus is god even if you believe allah is god and with it believe jesus christ peace be upon him is almighty god it is shirk you have to worship allah and allah alone the moment you worship with allah someone else like jesus christ or say with allah i believe ram is god or i believe krishna is god it is shirk so you have to believe in allah alone and no one else and worship him alone and no one else so if someone says i believe in hinduism and islam can i go to jannah the answer is no you have to believe in islam only and believe those parts of hinduism which match with the quran and say hadith no problem but which is against quran and say hadith you cannot follow if you follow that you cannot go to paradise hope that answers the question next question from hilal ahmed from noida india can muslims go and visit the places of worship of non muslims depends upon what is your purpose to visit the places of worship of the non muslims if you are going to know what the religion says so that you can do more dawa to them it's perfectly permitted i have visited various places of worship i have gone to various temples many i have gone to various churches i have had discussion with the priests with the pandits my main purpose was dawa if you go for sight seeing thinking it will benefit you in understanding islam better and knowing the wrong things what the non muslims are doing it is permitted but if you go to a house of worship of a non muslim like many muslim politicians do in india and in other parts of the world that they want to show that they believe in other religion so if they go for the inauguration of a temple that's totally prohibited you cannot go to inauguration of a temple and many muslim politicians go to show that okay we are secular it is haram you cannot endorse a place of worship of the non muslim you cannot endorse a temple or a church so if you are going to show to the people that you believe that the other religion is also correct and you visit that place it is forbidden but if you are going to understand the religion better so that you can do dawa it's perfectly all right if you go for sight seeing as long as that sight seeing doesn't take you away from islam and your islam is strong and you understand the non muslim religion so that you can do dawa to them it is perfectly fine to visit the places of worship of the non muslims next question from mohammed anas from south africa what should a non muslim do if his or her parents do not allow him or her to accept islam assuming that the non muslim is an adult and in different countries the law for taking decisions on your own may differ some country it is 18 years some it is 16 some it is 19 if the non muslim is adult and if he reads islam and accepts islam and if the non muslim parent or the non muslim father or mother is disagreeing doesn't agree that his son or his daughter should accept islam what should he do allah is very clear cut in the quran allah says in surah luqman chapter 31 verse number 14 we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to their parents in travel upon travel the mother bore them and in years to in was the meaning that means it is compulsory for the muslims to respect their parents but the next verse surah luqman chapter 31 verse number 15 says but if your parents do jihad struggle and strive to make you worship somebody else besides allah then do not obey them but yet live with them with love and companionship allah repeats the message in surah ankabut chapter 29 verse number 8 we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to their parents but if their parents strive and struggle to jihad and force you to worship somebody else besides allah of whom you have no knowledge then do not obey them so here allah goes out of the way to say that you have to respect your parents obey them but if they tell something against the teaching of the quran against the teaching of beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you should not follow them so if a non muslim children they realize that islam is the true religion and they want to accept islam and if that non muslim parent is preventing the best thing the son or the daughter can do is explain to the father and the mother what is the true concept of islam what is the concept of tawhid about the teaching of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and try and make them understand that islam is the logical religion it is the best way of life if they get convinced alhamdulillah if they don't get convinced as a last resort you have to leave the house you can surely contact some of your muslim friends and leave the house so that 
you can practice Islam freely. You can leave the house and but naturally once you accept Islam, you have to pray five times, you have to give zakat, you have to fast. So all these things would not be possible for you to live under the same roof with your parents who are objecting. If they agree, you can stay in the same house and continue. If they object, as the last resort, you try a level best to convince them so that even they accept Islam or at least convince them that what you are doing is right. So they follow their religion and you follow Islam. But if you cannot, and if they give you the ultimatum, even you have to leave, you leave the house and follow Islam outside the house, inshallah, Allah says in the Quran that the land of Allah is spacious. You will find many a refuge in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, Islam 100. So if you have to leave your house, leave your land, leave the country for the sake of Allah and the Mustab, Allah will protect you. The next question, if Islam is the best religion, then why Christians are more in number than us? Mirza Wasif Zari from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Mirza, the question of Islam is the best religion, then why are Christians more in number? Point number one, those who are in the maximum number, those who are in majority are not always right. This is a wrong concept that those who are in majority are always right. And that which is in large numbers correct. I can give you several examples. If you ask someone which is the best car available in the world, some may say Rolls Royce, some may say Bentley. But you know that the number of Rolls Royce in the world are very few. The number of Bentley are very few. The number of Maybach are very few. The largest company of cars that is sold is Toyota. And Toyota is not the best. It may be, it may not be. For knowing what is the best, you have to analyze the specifications. If you want to know which is the best car, you have to know what is the average of the car, what is the safety measures, what is the look of the car, what is it made of, what is the pickup, what is the horsepower, all these things. Then you can decide, not just who is using it maximum. And even a person using a Toyota will agree that Rolls Royce is better, but he would not want to spend that much money. He may not have the money or he may not want to spend the money, he may have the money. Let me tell you, I do agree with you. People who fill the census form today in the world, maximum are Christian. They are close to 2.5, 2.75 billion and Muslims are about more than 2 billion in the world. So I do agree with you. But the people who practice religion, number one is Islam. Out of the 2 billion people, majority practice Islam. At least the main pillar. Alhamdulillah. Maybe 75% or maybe close. But in Christianity, there is a small minute percentage. Maybe 5%, 10% who may be following the religion. They may fill the form. How many people go to church? How many people attend the services in the church? If you ask them, most of the Christians don't believe also Jesus is God. Most of the people don't believe in the teachings of the Bible. But yet, they fill the form and they say they are Christian because they have to mention the religion. So as far as following the religion is concerned, today in the world, the maximum religion that is followed is Islam and the Muslims. Surely more than a billion. But those people who claim a Christian, then according to survey, inshallah in the next maybe 50 years, Islam will also overtake Christianity even in numbers in filling of census form. So the number which is maximum is not the best. The best is that which you have to see the criteria. So if you compare the Quran and if you compare the Bible, there is no doubt at all that if you compare it with the test of science or with logic or with reason, surely Quran will pass the test and the other scriptures of other religions will fail the test. So, if you see which religion is practiced most in the world, it is Islam and Alhamdulillah Islam is the best religion and Allah clearly says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse number 19, Inna dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Next question from Anush from Kashmir, India. Can a Muslim girl become an IAS officer in India with the intention of serving the Ummah? I would like to ask the sister that why does she want to become an IAS officer in India to serve the Ummah? There are multiple things better that a woman can do. Why should a woman go out of the way to become an IAS officer and will she be able to maintain the rules of the Quran and Sunnah? So if you want to serve the Ummah, number one is you have to follow the rules and regulation of Allah and His Rasul. The best act of a Muslimah, of the Muslim woman, is to be a good mother. There's nothing better than that. The status that a Muslimah gets because she's a mother 
is phenomenal. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that paradise lies beneath the feet of the mother. And the child, even if you give a mountain of gold to the mother, he cannot compensate what the mother has done by keeping that child in her womb for nine months. The very hadith. Now, how can you overlook all these hadith? You want to become IAS officer. Now, do you think becoming an IAS officer as a woman, will you be able to maintain the hijab? Will you be able to maintain the rules and regulations that have been prescribed in the Quran and Sahih Hadith? And the answer is no. As an IAS officer, you may have to work closely with the male, which is not permitted. You will not be able to maintain the hijab. Your dress code will be different. So, but natural, the best profession, if you want to do a profession after being a mother, if you want to do something for the Ummah, number one is the profession of a dai. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila chapter 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحَسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ دَعِلَ اللَّهِ وَأَمِلُ الصَّالِحَوْ وَقَالَ إِنَّ نِمِلْ مُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. The best profession for a Muslim is a dai. So even for the Muslim ma, this is for the Muslim male, yes. Even for the Muslim, the best profession is a fadai. And that's the reason that when I wanted to marry someone, I wanted to marry a daya. Because the sawab that a woman will get, but naturally she is supposed to dawa with the woman. A woman doing dawa to a woman is far more serving the ummah and doing islah to the Muslim who may not be knowing the teachings of Islam. So if you are doing da'wah to non-Muslim, the non-Muslim woman, and doing da'wah to the Muslim woman, getting them closer to Quran and Sunnah, that's a million times better service than you becoming an IS officer. Being an IS officer, there are high chances that you may go away from the deen. You may not be able to follow the rules and regulations. So number one best profession after becoming a mother is becoming a da'ya. Number two, you can become a teacher. You can teach in an Islamic school or Islamic college, teach them deen, give them education. Number three, you can become a counselor. You can be a child counselor. You can counsel the Muslim, the children. Get them closer to Islam if you want to serve the Ummah. You can become a doctor. You can become a gynecologist. If you become a gynecologist, you are preventing hijab being broken by your Muslim sisters. By becoming a doctor, it's a noble profession. A gynecologist or become a pediatrician. You can do speciality. There are various other options. Why should you become an IS officer? First, an IS officer is not a job to be done by a woman. And that too by a Muslim woman. You will not be able to maintain your hijab. You will not be able to maintain all your principles. So my advice is it is not at all permissible for a Muslim ma to become an IS officer in India. You will not be serving the Ummah. You will be, in fact, going away from the deen and leave us at the Ummah, you will be paving your pathway not to heaven but away from the heaven. So inshallah, I hope that you become a good mother, become a daya or become a teacher or a child counselor or a doctor. Hope that answers the question. The next question is from Firdosul Haq, Kerala, India. Can a Muslim become an IAS officer or an IPS officer in a democratic country like India? First question was from a Muslim, a Muslim sister. This question is from a Muslim male. A similar question asked by Shahil Ahmed from Kolkata, India. I recently completed my B.Tech in Computer Science and got job offers from many multinational companies but I haven't joined yet because I want to become an IAS officer to serve my country. But there are a few things that are discouraging me from becoming one. Number one, the current political situation which increases hatred against Muslims. Number two, after meeting a few bureaucrats, they say civil servants are bound to get corrupted because they can't overrule the orders of their corrupt political masters. Number three, constitutionally, politicians can harass you because they have power to transfer and remove any civil servant from important posts and give less important posts. Since I'm a practicing Muslim, what is the advice? Both these questions are related. The first question posed by the Muslim brother, that can he become an IS officer or an IPS officer in a democratic country like India? And the answer is depending upon whether can you follow the deen after becoming an IS officer or IPS officer. If you can, it is permissible. If you cannot, it's not permissible. It will depend upon each individual. And the question posed by the second brother, that he wants to become an IS officer, but there are few queries 
And all these three queries are very important and need to be addressed separately. The first thing he said is that seeing the hatred towards the Muslims being increased in India, will he be able to do the job of an ass officer? And the answer is, it will be difficult. It's not impossible. It's possible but difficult. Now when your colleagues start attacking you, attacking Islam, attacking the Prophet, attacking you as a Muslim, do you have the ikhma to reply? Do you have the courage to reply to them is important. If you're a timid person and you cannot reply and you're shy, so my advice is that don't take such job. If you think you can answer them, you're good in replying, you're bold, you can take it, then go ahead with it. Whether you become an IPS officer, whether you become an IS officer. And the second point post was that because when you take this post, there is bound to be that you may be tempted to do wrong things. You may be tempted for bribery, you may be tempted to do things which are illegal according to the country, which haram activity in Islam. And I agree with the person totally that when you're in high position like an IPS officer, and it's common that if not all, then majority of the IPS officers, not all, but the majority for sure, they are corrupted. And if an honest officer goes there, he either becomes corrupt or he has to leave the job. So in this situation, you are the Muslim, bribing is haram. How can you take bribe? How can you become corrupt? It's a challenge for you. Because the setup is such of these government, whether an IS officer or whether an IPS officer, that if you don't agree with them, they make life difficult for you. And the third part is that the political bosses, if you don't follow them, they will transfer you. Yes, they can transfer you. So my advice to you is that if you are strong, if you know that you have the courage not to involve in bribery, you will not do corruption, you will do justice, you will follow the Quran and Sunnah. And if the political bosses tell you something, one thing you are sure that if you are honest, they cannot remove you, they can transfer you, yes. They put you to a place which is isolated. But when they transfer you, if there is no evidence of yours, which is against the law, what they will do? They cannot demote you. They can transfer you. And when they transfer, very often they may have to give you a higher position. I know some officers, Muslim officers, which were very honest. Because they were honest, they kept on being transferred. And because they were transferred, they kept on getting a raise very fast. So at a young age, they reach the top position very fast. Alhamdulillah, so it's a blessing in disguise. So if you are such a person who is a Muslim, who is strong, who can face the criticism of the non-Muslim, who can face the attack of the non-Muslims against Islam, and who is going to be honest, who will accept the challenge and say that I will not involve in bribery, I will not do corruption, I will give justice, even if it goes against myself, I will protect the Muslims, then go ahead with the job. Whether it's an IPS officer, whether it's an IS officer, it's going to be a challenge, it's going to be difficult. I know many Muslims who have taken this job and have deviated away from Islam. There are a few that I know who have stuck to the straight path. If you know that you are bold, if you can take the challenge, if you have that metal in you, then go ahead. Alhamdulillah, otherwise it is safer for you not to take up such a job. Time is short, we'll just take one last question before we end the session. From Al Hassan from Ghana, I work for a non-Muslim company. The company does not allow me to pray during working hours. Should I work in such a company? I mentioned in my earlier session that praying Salah five times is the fard for every Muslim. There is no option, irrespective of wherever he works. Even if he's sick for a man, he has to work. If he cannot stand, he has to sit and pray. If he cannot sit, he has to lie and pray. Even while doing jihad in the battlefield, he has to pray. One group prays, the other keeps watch. Then the second group prays and the first group keeps a watch. There is no excuse unless you are unconscious. That is the only condition. Or you are a minor. It is accepted that you do not pray if you are an adult. And if you are conscious, whether you are sick, it is compulsory to pray. If you are working in a company which does not allow you to pray, I request you go to the boss and tell, okay, please give me 10 minutes break to pray. Normally, there are two prayers that come when you work, Zohar and Asar. It is very common that Zohar Salah comes during the time of your lunch break. So surely, you don't have to take permission while lunch break, when you are having a break for half an hour, 45 minutes, you have your lunch fast and then pray Salah or pray Salah and have your lunch fast. So surely, one of your Salah of Zohar in any profession is easily solved and no one can prevent you from praying during your break. Regarding the other prayer asar time, there are high chances that you will be during your working hours. There may be a tea break, may not be a tea break. If it is 
coinciding with the working hours, go to your boss and say that please give me 10 minutes, I want to pray. Go to a nearby mosque, pray and come back. If not in the mosque, make a jamaat if there are few Muslims in that, go to a musalla, go to a small room, pray together and tell the boss, okay, give me 10 minutes break, I will work 20 minutes extra. Who would say no? According to me, most of them, even the non-Muslim will agree. There may be few who will object. If your boss or if your company objects, say, no, you cannot offer salah, there is no option. You have to leave the job, search for another job. You may get a job with a better salary. Even if you get a job with a lesser salary, don't worry. It will benefit you in the akhirah and the dunya also. If you are not allowed to pray in any activity, whether it be a job or whether it be any way, sport or any other activity, what you are doing, praying five times is the fard. You have to pray. If you cannot pray in that particular job, leave the job, change your job where you can pray. This was the last question and I would like to thank the viewers. Inshallah, we'll meet again next time. And as I said, that in this season, Mashallah, my son Farik has joined me. May Allah give him the hikmah, may Allah give him the courage, may Allah give him the niyama, may Allah bless him to answer the questions and may Allah make him a very successful day. You're most welcome when you write the question, you can mention the name also, whether it's to, to me or whether it's to Farik. The line this time was not very good. Therefore, there are disturbances. We pray that next time, inshallah, the line is better. So, till we meet next time for the program, ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Same time next Saturday. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhiru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alamin.